Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church. Healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Ashley, and I am so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, pen, and paper, your phone, however you want to take notes, and get ready for today's message. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. So we are in our second week of Good Grief, talking about grief, how, how to deal with grief in our lives. And I'm gonna go ahead and tell you the title of today's message, and it's called, Whose Fault Is It? Whose Fault Is It? When it comes to grief, I wanna make this point very clear. Pain always looks for someone to blame. Yep. Pain always looks for someone to blame. Failure, loss, despair, someone needs to be blamed. And if you're like me, this couldn't possibly be my fault. The world is against me. Somebody is doing this to me because it's not my fault. Someone hurt me, someone stole from me, someone caused me to experience this loss or this pain. And to be honest with you, this has been the struggle of humanity from the beginning of time. It has to be someone else's fault. Yeah. It's called scapegoating, right? Scapegoating, someone else's fault. In Genesis 3, verse 8, it's the story of Adam and Eve, and it says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. Now, come on, everybody. You know when you did something wrong as a kid, and then you heard your mom or dad's footsteps coming down the hallway. Like, your mom and dad told you, do not jump on the bed, and there you are, er -ee, er -ee, er -ee, jumping on the bed, and you hear your parents' footsteps coming down the hallway. You jump off the bed real quick, and you go hide in the closet. <laughs> Nobody? <laughs> Nobody was afraid of their mom and dad up in here. Nobody got their tail whooped for disobedience. Okay. I was angelic. <laughs> <Just saying. laughs> Thank you. Mother Cindy, full of grace. <laughs> the Lord is with me. So this is what happens. They messed up. They, they, they disobeyed God. They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They went and hid, but the Lord God called out to them, where are you? He knew where they were. He's omniscient, omnipotent. He didn't have to ask that. He knew where they were. And so like, as a kid, I'm like, that's a dumb question. Like, God knows everything. He knows where they are. Mm -hmm. He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid. I was naked, so I hid. God said, who told you you were naked? Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I told you not to eat from? He knew they did. Yeah. <laughs> but what God is doing is he's restoring communication. God is always looking to restore communication with his children. He's always looking for you. As much as you can run from him and, and, and feel like you've disappointed him, he is always there looking for you. From the beginning of time, did you eat from the tree I told you not to? The man said, that woman! The woman that you put here! It ain't me. It's my fault. It's her fault. And it's your fault. It's your fault because you put her here. I was fine by myself. If it was just me, God, I wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't have done it. She messed me up. You know the kind of stuff she got? She's gotten me in more trouble. She got me in more debt. <laughs> she gave it to me, and I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, what have you done, woman? And she said, it was the serpent. <laughs> That serpent deceived me. It could not be me. So it was either God's fault, it was her fault, or it was the serpent's fault, but it wasn't our fault. And just like Adam and Eve, we do this too. When we experience blame, uh, pain, yeah. when we experience hurt, when we experience tragedy, someone must be blamed. Yep. The year was 2007. We had planned and prayed and 
prepared to have our third child. This was going to be our baby boy. We had worked at this. We had strategized. We, we, we looked up all the websites, how to make sure you had a baby boy. <laughs> right? Come on. So nobody in here did research to figure out after you had two, three, four, five girls, how to have a boy. Nobody? <laughs> well, we did. All right. How, you know, what can we do? It's going to be a boy. We had two amazing, beautiful, healthy girls, and our family would be complete with our son. They would be two years apart, right? Caitlin, Michaela, and this was going to be Michael Joseph McKelvey Jr. Mm -hmm. So excited. I dreamed of this moment my whole life. And on this day in 2007 was going to be our second sonogram. We already had that first sonogram where it was just like a blob in the, on the screen. And now the second one is where you start to see all the detail of the baby. And I knew what to experience because I had been through this with the two girls. And we were so happy. We were so giddy. In the car ride, we were like, we're going to see the baby, going to see the baby. We packed two car seats in our car at the time and buckled them in tight. We're going to see the baby. We're going to see the baby. We sang as we drove off to the hospital for the sonogram. Cindy got onto the sonogram table and they put that jelly on her belly. And I sat across the room and I had a girl on each knee and we're bouncing up and down. We're going to see the baby. We're going to see the baby. And uh, I told the girls, I said, hey, uh, in just a few seconds, they're gonna put the microphone on the baby and we're gonna hear baby Mikey's heartbeat. And it's gonna sound like this. It sounds really funny when you hear the heartbeat through this microphone that the doctor has. And the technician was there and the technician was drawing all the lines on the screen, taking all the measurements. There was my little peanut on the screen. There's his head and there's the body but there's no swishing sound. I'm bouncing the girls in anticipation, but inside I'm getting a little nervous because I'm saying, hey guys, just wait. Just wait, she's gonna put the microphone in. We're gonna hear the swishing sound and we're waiting for a sound that never came. And the technician looked up with tears coming down her face and she leaned forward and she said to Cindy, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but there's no heartbeat. <clears throat> Cindy sat up from the table and looked at me with a look that penetrated my heart. Uh, I will never ever get the look out of my mind that she gave me that day of absolute despair, like as if Someone had just ripped her heart out and she was looking to me to fix it. <clears throat> and I sat there helpless. I can fix anything. I can fix cars. I can fix houses. I can fix buildings. I can fix technology. I can fix clocks. I couldn't fix this. And she's looking at me to fix it in this Instant grief hit me, this instant pain hit me, this instant loss for something I had never met, a person I had never known. And I couldn't protect my kids in this moment. I couldn't protect them from, because I had, I had built up the anticipation. I couldn't protect Cindy from this moment. And we just sat there kind of dazed and confused and mm -hmm. I motioned to you. And what, did I, what did I motion to you? What did I do? Not to cry. Like, don't, don't cry. I said, don't let the kids see. We can't talk about this right now. We can't do this right now. We can't, we can't let the kids know that anything's wrong. And I put this, put this face on. Mm -hmm. My little girl sat there and said, Daddy, where's the swish swish? And I had no, I had no answer. I had no tools. My heart was broken. Not only was this child dead, but now was my dream. The dream that I was gonna have this son that I was gonna leave all my stuff to. Like, I had it all planned out. And I took it really hard. And maybe you're sitting here today and you're, you're like, man, dude, like, 
we went through this like 10 times. What's your problem? I can't tell you what my problem is. I don't know because grief doesn't make sense. And, and, and if, you, if you're not, if, if you were never prepared to experience a loss like that, like I wasn't, like everything's always worked out for me. I've never had a loss. I, it, it's never, it was never crossed our minds that we would have a miscarriage. Yeah. I tried to rationalize it. It's just an embryo. It was just a fetus. But in my heart, that was my son. I had already named him. I had already prepared the room in the house that the nursery that we were never gonna fill. Got in the car. We turned the music up really, really loud so the kids couldn't hear. And we had a moment. We had a cry moment. The pain in my chest was unbearable. and I wasn't prepared for this. And this wasn't my fault. So it had to be somebody's fault. Somebody had to be blamed for this pain I was feeling and it wasn't me. And I was raised that God is good all the time. So it had to be her fault. Mm -hmm. Pain always looks to somebody to blame. It's kind of like your brain can't understand the fact that sometimes things just happen and it's not the fault of anybody. And now for me, it never crossed my mind that Mike would be feeling this way. You know, we were a team. We were in this together. He had to know that something was stolen from us. Because my Bible says in John 10.10 10, that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's how I felt. I had felt like something had been stolen from me and I wanted it back. I was grieving. I was hurting. But I had no tools to communicate that to him. I was already hurting by the news that we weren't going to have a baby. And then I was also grieving about the fact that I had to have a procedure. And I had never had any procedures before. But I still had two babies at home. So you just had to deal with it. I could tell that Michael was pulling away from me. But I didn't know how to reach him because I was hurting. I wasn't really thinking about reaching him because I was trying to deal with my own stuff. And the tools of, we didn't have the tools of communication. No. Um, I'm a person who wants to over talk, over analyze, mm -hmm. over communicate. If I'm hurting, I wanna, I wanna talk it out and see, hey, am I being stupid? Does this making sense? And I'd say to her, how are you feeling? What are you experiencing? I don't know, mm -hmm. I don't know. And the more she would say, I don't know, the angrier I got, so it just kept being easier to blame her for this loss because she would just tell me, I don't know. Well, how are you feeling? I don't know. W what are you thinking about? I don't know. Mm -hmm. And now I'm totally cut out. I'm totally cut out about what she, I can't fix something that she doesn't know what's going on. And we kind of grew further and further apart. We did not pull together as a team. After that day in the car, when we cried, we never talked about it. We never talked about it. It never came up. It was never a discussion. We didn't go to counseling. We didn't see anybody. We didn't sit down and say, hey, are we processing this correctly? And now that I look back on it, it seems strange that we didn't talk about it because now we talk about everything. But back then, we didn't know how. We didn't know how to talk about grief. We didn't know how to talk about pain. We didn't know how to talk about loss. We didn't know how to say, I'm hurting and I'm blaming you. Well, because I really didn't want my marriage to be ruined and I really didn't want her to know I was blaming her because then I, I, I had power blaming her. I had control blaming her. I think the, the, the biggest hurdle was that we were told that there was no heartbeat, but then we didn't, you didn't pass the baby. Yeah. So we had this time where we were actually standing in faith that God could do a miracle. God could do a miracle. God can bring those dead things back to life again. And we were standing on his word and we were scheduled for another sonogram. We're like, okay, maybe, maybe there was just a problem with the sonogram machine and, and the, this next time it would be alive and we'd be fine and 
in the end, we had to schedule DNC. Mm -hmm. uh, Cindy had never gone into surgery. She had never been under anesthesia. And there we were, me and her, at the hospital, alone, having to deal with this, with yep. no real tools to do it. We had already announced to the church that we were pregnant. Uh, we were, it was kind of like already in the church newsletter that we were expecting. And so now there was this another element of shame that we had to go back to church and kind of let people know this isn't going to happen. I didn't handle grief well. I'm sitting up here in front of you today telling you I did not handle it well. There was no good grief Mike McKelvey here. It was only bad grief and tremendously painful grief for me. And someone had to be blamed. Now, like you said earlier, I'm not a big talker of the feelings. <laughs> I handle most physical and emotional pain in pretty much complete silence. Yeah, even during childbirth. Yeah. Didn't I, really make any sounds or. No noise. <laughs> I know that's Just weird. Just anger at me. <laughs> Eyes of anger at me. Remember, pain needs someone to blame. <laughs> you did this. I'm no, just kidding. Nope. <laughs> I just shut it down and handle it till it's done. Um, and that's what I did. You know, you get up, you clean the house, you cook the food. You take care of everything, but you keep the pain inside because, like, to me, it was hiding it from the kids. I don't even know so much if it was to, like, hide the pain, but I don't know. Who wants to be a mess in front of their kids? Like, that's not how I ever wanted to be in front of the kids. Let's, let's share this. Let's share this Bible verse here that is kind of like what we thought we needed to do. Yeah. In 2 Samuel 12, 19 to 23, it says... David noticed that his attendants were whispering amongst themselves, and he realized that his child was dead. So David had this child with Bathsheba. The child was sick. He was fasting. He was praying. He was before the Lord. And based upon their whispering, he now realizes that the child has passed away. So he asks them. They say, yes, the child is dead. And then David gets up from the ground. It says, after he had washed, he put on lotions and changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he went to his own house, and at his request, they served him food, and he ate. His attendants asked him, why are you acting this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But now that the child is dead, you get up and eat. He answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he's dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him one day, but he will not return to me. And so we thought we just needed to like get up and get moving, mm -hmm. move on. We got things to do. We got other kids to raise. Let's just pack this up, put it away, hide it somewhere, just, and just yeah. get moving. And we never thought about the fact that we actually were talking about this last night. When you actually read the passage, you realize that he had grieved up until the point that he lost his child. Like he was dealing with his emotions, and then he moved on. Where for us, we never, we, we just, just tried, tried to move on. on. And I honestly, I had no idea that Mike was hurt by the whole thing because we never talked. Until I asked to try again. And he said never. Never. <laughs> never. And when mm -hmm. I tell you that, in my heart of hearts, never. I was never having another kid. I was never trying. I was never putting myself in that position again. Now, you can sit here today, you understand that we have a third child. Um, so maybe you can sit here and say, ah. But in, I knew, I knew that I knew that I knew. You can ask her. Mm -hmm. It was venomous fights. Never am I allowing you to put me in that position again to hurt me. And here's this, you know, Mike's always kind of been larger than life. I believe he could do anything he sets his mind to. He can conquer the world. And he gave up. He gave up because of grief. And so we were taught to shut down the crying. And I did. Till that dang Marley and Me movie. Marley and Me? <laughs> no Marley and Me movie? <laughs> From hell. <laughs> but watching the movie, and if you've seen the movie, you'll know that Jennifer Aniston goes through basically the same thing. 
towards the front of the movie, and I found myself sobbing on the couch with one of my little girls laying on me. Ugly sobbing, like <laughs> boogers, tissues, the whole nine. Mm -hmm. Basically until the movie ended, and then I shut it down and went on. Yeah, and I, I honestly can't tell you why this affected me so bad. I can't. Um, maybe because it's my first big loss, my first tragedy. Like, I was raised in a good home. Um, everything my dad did was a success. Everything we ever tried was a success, and it was like my first big failure. And I wasn't taught self-awareness. I wasn't taught to take responsibility for your own actions and for your own emotions. I, I didn't know those things. Like, I, I can't tell you why I grieved so bad. I can't tell you why I blamed my wife for this. It was wrong. I now see that, but in the moment, it was easier for me to blame her mm -hmm. than to just simply say, okay, something that we tried to do together was sick. It was, there was something broken about it. Maybe it was because I lost control. I lost my ability in that moment to protect my wife from hurt and protect my kids. And funny, right? Like, I lost the control to do it so that I'm just gonna hurt her more. And I'm gonna inflict pain and I'm gonna inflict hurt because I can no longer protect her from it. It, was just, it doesn't make sense. But again, grief doesn't make sense. As true as I sit here today, that conversation happened, her asking me to try again, never. And this grief that we experience began to drive a wedge, an invisible wedge between the two of us. She didn't know that that wedge was there, but she knew that I was checked out. She knew that I was gone. She knew that I was done with this relationship. I was heartbroken. I had, I have dreams, I, I build dreams, I build, I build like every few years, like what I know I'm gonna do and what I'm going to accomplish in my life. And I've got these goals and these things. So I knew I was gonna be married young. I knew I was gonna own a home young. I knew that I was gonna be successful in business, whether it was in the church world or not in the church world. Like I've, I've always got these things and, and I knew that I was gonna have a son and then church people, I, you know, I came to the church, I was like, hey, we lost the baby, yeah, baby Mikey, blah, 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 and people said stuff like, maybe it's just not God's will for you to have a son. Now I'm devastated. It's not God's will yep. for me to have my lifelong dream. What's wrong with me? that God can't trust me with a son. And we got further and further apart. Mm -hmm. Now, what did we say last week? Grief does not make sense. You know now that it doesn't make sense, right? I do. Okay. <laughs> now I do. <laughs> but here's what we need to understand today. In 1 Peter 5, 6 through 9, it says, humble yourselves. Therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. There are four things in this passage that tell us what we can do when we find ourselves in these kind of situations and in times of grief. The first one is to cast all your cares on the Lord. The second one is to be alert and sober-minded. Also resist the devil and to stand firm in the faith. These are tools and you can implement them in any time, in most any challenges where you find yourself blaming someone other than who it actually deserves to be blamed. So first, cast your care on the Lord. This is a physical, actual action. You have to choose to both physically and mentally decide that this is not your pain to carry. 
It's not your shame to carry. It's not your depression to carry. The Lord is here to carry it for you. But you have, it's a physical, uh, it's hard to say. It's, it's mental, it's emotional, but yeah. you physically have to like make that decision. Mm -hmm. Like before you physically go to the gym, you have to physically, mentally make yourself go to the gym. You know what I'm saying? Like you have to like inside yourself say, no, I am going to the gym tomorrow. Yeah. And then physically walk yourself to the gym. And that's what this casting, it's, it's yeah. mental, but it's physically mental. Mm -hmm. I have to literally cast that care on the Lord. I have to say, this is not mine to carry. This is not my pain to carry. This is not my hurt to carry. Yeah. He, he took those pains on the cross for me. I'm to cast it on the Lord. The next part is to be alert and sober-minded. So you have to pay attention. You have to realize that the enemy is trying to steal from you. And you have to be sober. And here I want to stop and say, I know a lot of times we think sober, so we think either drinking or drugs or something. But anything that numbs your senses would fit right here. But, le but, but let's, let's just say a lot of times in grief, and I, I'm mm -hmm. guilty of it as well, um, not being sober because of the pain. Oh, absolutely. It's easier to mm -hmm. take some sort of medication, prescribed or not, to numb the hurt yep. instead of dealing with it. And basically what this, this, if you break down what these words here, be alert, it says wake up. Yep. Wake up and realize that you're in a fight. Mm -hmm. I think Mike Tyson, I think it was Mike Tyson that said uh, he, doesn't, he really didn't wake up to be in a fight until he got punched in the face first. Like he had to get punched <laughs> in the face once to realize that he was in a fight. And, and this would kind of say, like, wake up. You're in a fight. There's an enemy around who's prowling around trying to steal from you. Wake up. Be sober. The next one is resist the devil. Here's another action step. You have to resist the enemy. You have to or not allow his attack to take over your heart and your mind. It's so easy when we're going through something, that's all you think about. You know, if you're in pain, all you think about is how much pain you're in. As opposed to thinking about getting to the other side. And it's different to think about, I'm getting better. I may be in pain, but I'm healing, versus just feeling the pain. And it's great to feel the pain. We all should feel them. We've learned to feel the emotions that come at you, but don't get stuck there. Yeah, so like if you've ever dealt with anxiety, mm -hmm. like you've ever had an anxiety attack or panic attack, the more you think about how tight your chest is and you can't breathe, the tighter it gets. Yeah. Right? You have to resist that. You have to resist that in your mind to say, I am not going to think and meditate on this. I need to think and meditate on what's good and what's lovely and the promises of God. I've got to change my thing. I've got to resist that. Yep. And then lastly, we have to stand firm in faith. When we were going through this, I didn't know what his problem was. But I knew enough that I had to stand on the word and I had to pray in faith for him. Because as we said earlier in John 10, 10, it does say that the thief it's comes. It's the thief yes. that comes. To only steal, kill, and destroy. But I, meaning Jesus, says, I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. So that's the promise that you have to hold on to. Jesus, God, they want you to have a full, happy life. So yeah, so God's come to bring life. Yep. The life of our children, the life of the pregnancies. Mm -hmm. It was God who brings life. Yep. But the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. God is good, the devil's bad. The enemy steals, he robs, he brings the pain. Yeah. God brings joy, he brings healing, he brings health. Mm -hmm. There is someone to blame. Yeah. And it's the enemy. Mm -hmm. It's the devil yeah. who steals, kills, and destroys. Although in that moment, I thought my wife was the devil. <laughs> Come on, somebody, act like you ain't mm -hmm. never blamed your wife for something. Come on, or your husband mm -hmm. for something, right? My, 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 my gaze was shifted. I had the wrong one to blame, and instead of coming together, like, even in my own upbringing, like, we didn't really always, I didn't ever really team up with someone to get through something together. I was always kind of like that lone person. I could fix it by myself. Can we give you one more tool today? It's the power of two words that could radically change your relationship. And 
And it's this, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I blamed the wrong person. I'm sorry that I didn't have the tools to grieve well and that I put the wedge between us. We now have different tools. We now have different tools emotionally. We now have different tools biblically. We've read books on relationships. We've read books on self-awareness and, and understanding what we're going through. But the power of when I've blamed the wrong person, when I've acted in a way that was not God-honoring, that didn't build our marriage, that inflicted more wounds on my wife than healed, I'm sorry. And I can remember the first day that, I mean, I thought I had said I was sorry like a gazillion times. And there's a day that I said it to you and you just broke and you start crying and I'm like, what the heck is wrong with you? Like, mm -mm. And she's like, that's the first time mm -hmm. that you said you were sorry. Ah, get out of here. I said it a gazillion <laughs> times. And she's like, no, that's the first time that you looked at me, you spoke into me, mm -hmm. and said that I was sorry. I'll tell you today, life is really short. <laughs> yeah. Life is short. Let's not live another day in agony, another day in anger, another day in disappointment. Like, we gotta talk these things out. There's something in your relationship, a wedge that's being built, that's there. There's an unspoken hurt. Let's call it by name. Let's identify what this is. Yep. Let's have an intelligent conversation, not a crazy screaming cussing match. That's, that's not healthy, that's not what we're talking mm -hmm. about. And if you can't talk without doing that, then you need a mediator. You need to go to a counselor where when you start to act that way, they can center you and bring you back, okay? So sometimes you do need to seek counsel. Sometimes you do need to go to a therapist to get some of these hurts of your past out because we gotta realign with what the word of God says. There is a thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy him. He's not just coming to steal, kill, and destroy your dreams or you. But he wants to still kill and destroy your relationships. He wants to destroy your marriage. Mm -hmm. He wants to destroy your children and your children's future. We gotta understand that we need to stand firm in the faith, that we need to cast our cares to the Lord. We need to lean in on him and he will lift you up. Yeah. I'm here to lift her up and she's here to lift me up. But really, the only one who's the mender of the broken heart is God. I can't fix her heart. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you're here today and you've ever found yourself in a grieving moment that you would say, there's just no hope. I remember one day I was working a side job. I was building a deck at someone's house and I came back to the church because the guy who was working with me, his car was here. I dropped him off at the church, and when I did, I saw a guy standing outside the building, and he was shaking the doors really hard. He was trying to get in the building. So I stopped, and I was like, yo, dude, what's up? And he came at me, like, real hard. He was in, like, medical scrubs, so I knew he was, like, a nurse, or he worked at the hospital or something, and he came at me, like, real hard. So, like, you know, immediately, you come at me like that, I, I, yeah, I got my fist ready. I'm like, yo, what's up? <laughs> and he came at me, he was like, I need to talk to a pastor. And I'm like, oh, yeah, what's up? I wasn't going to identify as a pastor. <laughs> I need to talk to a pastor. I'm like, yeah, what's up? He was like, I've been watching TBN. I've been watching. And he named a bunch of different pastors on TV. He goes, and I've been doing what they said. I've been praying. And my mom still died. There's no hope. 
And when this guy said hope, there's no hope, it was like something punched me in the stomach. It was like a bomb went off in my belly. And I was like, you have no hope? And I said, well, let me ask you a question. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And he goes, no. I'm like, so you've been watching TBN, but you don't know Jesus. <laughs> Problem with that system. <laughs> Problem there. I said, the reason why you have no hope is because you have no Savior. Yeah. And there's only hope in a Savior. And Jesus Christ, he is the Lord. He is the Savior. And right there in my work clothes, I finally identified I'm a pastor. <laughs> I said, would you like to accept Jesus today? And we stood right outside the admin buildings and I led him to the Lord. He looked up at me, he goes, you don't understand. He said, if there wasn't a pastor here today, I was going across the street to that hotel and I was killing myself. I said, well, let me tell you something you don't understand. Nobody works today. Nobody works in this building today. I was not supposed to be here. I was driving by to drop another guy off from another job. And I said, and God set up a moment for you to meet with me to bring you hope. And I want to tell you today that if you've walked in here and you've experienced that same sort of thing, like there's no hope, I need a change in my life, I need something, which you need Jesus. Yeah. And if you're here today and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, we want to offer that to you today. And we pray a simple prayer, and it goes like this, if you repeat it with me. Dear God, Dear God I, come to you, I come to you just like I am. Just like I, am. I, believe I believe that Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is, my Lord is my Lord and my Savior. And my Savior. Jesus, Jesus, I invite you, I invite you into, my life into my life to change me and to make me new. Make me new. Thank, you Thank you for accepting me, for accepting me. in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Woo! Hey, if you're watching online and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you type amen in one of the chat rooms? One of our online hosts would love to connect with you and take you through some of our next steps. We have a six-day devotional called Starting Point which gets you started in your walk with the Lord. We'd love to get that to you. If you're in the room today and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you allow me two seconds to just celebrate you? Would you just wave at me and say, hey, I prayed that for the first time today. Anybody at all so we can celebrate you real quick? Anybody real quick? Wave at me. No, we're all family today? Awesome. Praise God. Love you guys. If you're here today and you said, you know, I'm really not sure about this whole Christian thing, but that was a really emotional talk that you guys did today. We have a book at the Welcome Center called Welcome Home. It talks about Christianity. It talks about what we believe. It's our gift to you. Stop by the Welcome Center and grab it. At the end of that book, it has that exact prayer that we just prayed. And maybe if there's a moment in your life where you're saying, you know what, I, I think I need to give this a shot. I need to give God a chance. Grab that book, have it in your nightstand, somewhere at your house that you could grab it and look back to it and see what, what, what the Bible says about the God that we serve, amen? Let me bless you today. Father, we thank you that your word will never return void, but it will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do. Lord, I thank you for giving us tools today so that we can grieve well when those situations come into our lives. Lord, I pray today that the joy of the Lord would be our strength, that we could have intentional conversations in our homes that would bring healing and hope moving forward. Lord, I pray today for that couple, that family, who they have been trying. I pray, God, that you bring life to their womb, that you bring life to their home. The Bible says that you would fill our homes with all good things. Lord, I pray that you would fill our homes with the things that we are desiring and the things that we've been believing for. As we leave here today, Lord, I bless everyone the sound of my voice. They're the head and not the tail above, never beneath. Everything they set their hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We love you. Have a great weekend. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark. And if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. 
We'd love to help you do that. And you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.